so let's start an update on streams. Uh, so the agenda, we are going to have a quick introduction to streams. Maybe not all of you are familiar with, uh, with streams because it's a pretty new feature. So uh, I'll give an overview and then we'll uh, see what we've been doing, working on in the last uh, couple of releases for BTMQ. So the change log in 3.11 and 3.10. And then we'll see the new stuff coming in, in RabbitMQ 3.11. So uh, streams. So we uh, introduced streams uh, in RabbitMQ 3.9, uh, so about a year ago. So it's a new type type of data structure. Uh, it's an append-only log, so it's quite different in terms of semantics um, uh, from uh, regular queues that we have in uh, RabbitMQ. So a stream is always persistent and replicated. Uh, and it has non-destructive consumer semantics, so you can read messages, but uh, you actually don't remove them from the stream. So you can access streams with the uh, regular uh, protocols that we support in RabbitMQ, so MQP, uh, but also Stomp, MQTT. And we also created a brand new uh, protocol just for streams. Um, so what, streams, what are streams good uh, for? Uh, large fanouts, when you have um, a bunch of application wanted to read the same messages but do different processing. Uh, if you want to go back in time, replay, uh, you can read and reread your streams. Uh, with the stream protocol, we have quite a significant higher throughput than with regular queues. And uh, for, um, for large logs, so basically uh, streams are uh, persistent and uh, replicated, so they don't store much in memory uh, and they can just keep growing, whereas with a queue you want it to be uh, most of the time empty. So why did we introduce streams? So uh, we cannot do everything uh, with traditional queues. They have limitation uh, because of their nature, so um, streams complement queues and they uh, basically un unlock some new use cases that you can now address with RabbitMQ. Um, so let's be, uh, let's focus on uh, how three, um, queues uh, behave uh, so that we can see the difference with streams. So this is a regular uh, consumption pattern with uh, uh, a traditional queue. So you have a couple of messages in your queue at the top, the diagram, and you have a consumer. So the consumer gets the message, starts uh, doing its processing, and uh, then uh, acknowledges the message, and then the message is removed from the queue. So this is basically how queues work. Uh, at the end, you have um, the, the, the queues change. The message is no longer in the queue. So this is what we call destructive conception. So basically, reading is not uh, read-only. And for fanout, uh, for the fanout pattern with a queue in RabbitMQ. So if you have like uh, invoices or uh, orders coming from uh, your online store, uh, the message go to the exchange and maybe you want to do some different processings. So one for the, um, uh, the account application, uh, another uh, processing for the inventory application and so on. So you, what you're gonna do is that you, uh, you have competing consumers uh, on the queue. So you need basically to have several queues bound to the exchange and uh, connect your consuming application to its, its own queue. So uh, it works, but it means that we, if we have a bunch of uh, different processings, we need to uh, have a lot of queues bound to exchanges. So it's, it, work, but it, it works, but it doesn't really scale and um, we can maybe better use resources. So with a stream, you just have your messages uh, one after the other, like a big array, and you can plug your consumers anywhere you want. You can attach them at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end. Uh, so any number of consumers can consume from a stream, and they are not competing, and they don't remove messages. And you can imagine that you have the same application uh, reading the same stream, it can uh, be triggered on one day, uh, do, uh, does uh, all its processing, uh, and then the day later you have additional data 
and the application will just restart from the beginning and do again its compute its views, but with the additional data. So as I was saying, um, a stream is always persistent and replicated. So we are gonna have for each stream some kind of small cluster with the leader, accepting all the right operations, and then replicas that will follow uh, to uh, yeah, replicate the data. So you don't have a choice, uh, just like with queues, to have something in memory. Uh, streams are a bit more opinionated. And when you have a bunch of streams, uh, you don't end up with some node having all the stream leaders, the leaders get scattered uh, on, the, on the cluster. So in this case, you have three streams and their leader are on their uh, respective nodes. The stream is still considered a regular AMQP uh, resource, so it can be bound to any exchange uh, along over queues. Uh, so a classic queue or Chrome queue and then we, you have the stream. So it's really uh, like just an addition. You can benefit from it uh, immediately. And there's also this new protocol that we introduced, so the stream protocol. Uh, we designed it for uh, speed, uh, mostly, and uh, it's available in a plugin which, is, uh, which ships in the core distribution. Uh, and it's it's all integrated with uh, our infrastructure, so the management UI, the REST API. So when you have a stream client working uh, against the stream, it's gonna uh, publish and consume uh, to and from the stream directly. There's no exchange involved, there's no routing, just like with exchanges in the MQP. So you just uh, you know, work uh, against your stream uh, directly. In terms of performance, you, that's just numbers on a three node cluster, but it gives you an ID. So basically we have here with one uh, stream with very small messages, about one million messages per second. Um, it's much faster than uh, regular queues. Uh, several orders uh, of magnitude can be 10 or 20 times faster. It's just that streams are actually much simpler than queues in terms of data structure. Uh, again, they are kind of read-only, uh, whereas a queue, you, you always, you know, uh, a queue always changes, you move your messages, uh, so that's why a stream can be faster. It's not just better than a queue, it's just different. And it's all uh, works together, so you have good inter interoperability, you can have your uh, MQP clients and your stream clients working on the same stream, uh, reading the, the, the stream from the others and so on. Uh, so it's uh, basically seamless. And the guarantees, uh, so we have at least once, no message loss, thanks to publish confirms, uh, pretty much the same mechanism as in MQP. Message deduplication on the publishing side and flow control so that uh, consumers can uh, ask for new messages when they are ready. Other features uh, you can attach anywhere in the stream using a technical uh, integer, integer that we call the offset, but you can also attach at some point in time um, uh, using a time based, uh, just a timestamp basically. We have several indexes. Uh, there are also retention policies. Uh, if you, uh, you don't want to, your streams to grow forever, so uh, they, they are going to get truncated at some point. Uh, so it can be based on the age of the, the first messages in the, in the stream or uh, the size. We have also server-side offset tracking for, for consumers. They can um, uh, restart where they left off uh, using uh, data from the broker. Uh, it mean, I mean, it, you can also use your own data store to store your uh, offset, obviously. And also client-server TLS. Okay, so that was for uh, 3.9, all streams, that we, uh, how we ship, ship the, uh, stream in 3.9. So now, what happened in, uh, in a year? So, um, in 3.9, we uh, fixed a few bugs, uh, like some corner cases. 
for example, with leader elections for you know, inside our stream coordinator. Um, and also we, also, we also stabilized uh, some uh, part like dealing with uh, better with connection churn, uh, dealing better with uh, a large number of connections, or a bunch of optimization inside the main coordinator for streams. And we also refined um, the, the stream protocol, changed some small um, response code here and there, but it, it's mainly for the, the developer size, uh, side. Uh, 3.10, same thing, a few uh, bug fixes. We improved performance uh, for the implementation, the MQP uh, implementation of, of streams, because that's a, that's a specific queue type. And we also added replication over uh, TLS. So let's focus on uh, this one. So um, we added again um, TLS for replication, and but it's not uh, client-server TLS. We uh, had client-server TLS since the beginning, so you can secure the communication uh, between your application and uh, the broker uh, using TLS on top of the stream protocol. But there's something else. Um, so you learn in the keynote that uh, Erlang is, uh, uh, Erlang powers uh, RabbitMQ and nodes uh, communicate, communicate, communicate each other with uh, um, the Erlang distribution automatically because it's distributed. So this is what we call the Erlang distribution uh, mechanism. And it can be secured over TLS. So you just do a bunch of configuration with your private keys and certificate uh, and so on. And then all your nodes communicate with each other on top of TLS for uh, the, the Erlang side, okay? Uh, so again, it's been there for a long time, but uh, we added it, we added TLS for stream replication. St uh, streams do not use the Erlang distribution for TLS. Uh, uh, for, for um, sorry, stream does not use the Erlang distribution uh, to replicate, okay? Chrome queues do, for example, but for optimization, we, uh, we use just regular TCP connection for, for streams. So that's what we added, actually. So if you enable internode TLS, uh, the, the streams, uh, the stream system will automatically uh, detect this, uh, use the same uh, configuration, use all the certificates, the, the private key, the CA, and uh, use that to secure the stream replication over TLS. So it's just automatic. Clients. So for the stream protocol, we knew that we needed some new client libraries. Uh, and we um, have already a bunch of them. So we maintain uh, three in the RabbitMQ team. So to, for Java, .NET, and Go. Uh, and uh, we get contributions for, for them from the community. But uh, some people uh, from the community started also their own project. Uh, so thank you, uh, thanks to, thank to, to them. Uh, and uh, we have some uh, libraries for Erlang, Elixir, a couple of for Python, and also one for Rust. And there's one missing here because it was announced uh, last week for uh, JavaScript, if I remember correctly. Uh, so we are uh, building uh, the ecosystem around streams. Uh, and it, we knew it would be a significant effort because of the new protocol, but we are getting there little by little. Um, and we also uh, been writing uh, so documentation. If you take at the, if you look at the, the, the documentation of the stream Java client, it's quite uh, comprehensive. Not it's useful for the, the Java client itself, but it also covers 
uh, a bunch of uh, details on uh, streams themselves. And we've been uh, writing also articles on the blog to explain features, to explain the internal uh, uh, functioning of streams in some areas, and also to announce new features to cover them. So don't hesitate to read all these uh, resources. And now RabbitMQ 3.11. Um, so few minor things. Uh, people were asking to find out more about the, not the content, but the boundaries of their stream, the, the beginning, the end. So we introduced this uh, stream stat uh, command in the protocol so you can get the first index and the last index of the stream with this to find out if your uh, consumer is really behind for example. We also added a new field uh, when we deliver messages to consumers. So it's what we call a committed offset. It's basically the, the last uh, offset uh, in the stream. Uh, so now when you are actually consuming, you can get this information. So it was also a way to validate the versioning in the stream protocol because we bumped the version of this uh, deliver frame. So it's actually working. And then the two, the two uh, major features, uh, single active consumer and uh, super streams. Um, so we're, go we're gonna see first act single active consumer because super streams build on top of single active consumer. Um, so if you're familiar with single active consumer for queues, um, actually it's pretty much the same semantics for streams, kind of. It's, uh, it provides uh, exclusivity for uh, the consumption for a group of consumers, but also uh, some kind of continuity of service uh, for your uh, application when you have several instances of your uh, application running. So how does it work? It's pretty simple in terms, uh, in terms of concepts. Imagine that you have several instances of the exact same application um, if you specify uh, that these consumers belong to the same application uh, with just a couple of information on the client side, uh, only one of these uh, instances will get messages. So in this, uh, on this diagram, you see the messages flowing to uh, only one consumer at a time. The other, one, uh, the other ones are just you know, idle. And then you, when you stop uh, the consumer, the active one, or if it goes away, uh, the next in line will be activated automatically by the broker and it will uh, get uh, the messages uh, at this point. So this is the typical failover mechanism. So this way when uh, something goes in wrong or not, uh, if you uh, just want to upgrade your instance, um, you don't actually uh, uh, get behind. You are still processing your messages. So it's a, just like an um, uh, active passive system. And obviously, you, uh, you, 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 there's not only one group. Uh, it's not limited to one group. Uh, you can have, uh, you can apply the semantics of single active consumers so to several groups in uh, your uh, on your stream. So it could be just like again the um, the inventory application, the uh, or, uh, account application, and uh, they are just you know different groups, and the semantics apply to only those consumers. So it's single active consumer is quite a actually simple but useful uh, 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 feature. And we use it also for super streams. So super streams are a way to scale out. If you think that streams are not enough for your use cases, uh, you can consider super streams. Uh, so it's really yeah, a partitioning solution it preserves a message order within a partition, just like actually single active consumer preserve also a message order for uh, on a sing single stream. 
Uh, and uh, SuperStreams builds on top of single active consumer. So it's a bit better to, me, to be familiar with the semantics of single active consumer because we use them uh, inside uh, SuperStreams. So wh what's a SuperStream exactly? So it's just uh, uh, a bunch of individual streams. So uh, a SuperStream is more of a logical entity inside RabbitMQ. Uh, and um, in this example, you have your invoices, SuperStream, so that's your logical entity, and it's made of uh, three partitions, so just regular streams. Invoices, uh, that's a, a convention, invoices uh, dash zero, one, and two. Again, they are just regular streams. Uh, for publishing, uh, remember there's no uh, uh, exchanges involved in uh, streams with the stream protocol. So the, uh, the client application gets to choose the partition when it publishes a message. So there, there's, um, uh, there won't be any bottleneck on the broker side. Uh, it's all handled on the, the client side. Uh, so typically the, uh, the client libraries will provide some, uh, the, will do the heavy lifting, like hashing with a fast uh, and performant uh, hash uh, algorithm like Murmur, this is the one we use by default. Uh, but the, the client can, the, the use, the application developer can provide uh, a bit of application logic to find out, to extract the, uh, the information we need from the message to pick the appropriate uh, uh, partition. So if you use hashing, for example, uh, you are sending uh, invoices to your uh, super stream uh, and you want the, the you want all the invoices for the same consumer ending up in the same partition. Uh, so again, you will just provide, the, as an application developer, you will just provide uh, how to extract this information from, from the, the message, the customer ID, and then the client library will uh, hash and pick, uh, pick the uh, correct partition using a modulo operation. This way, everything's, uh, all the messages from the same customer end up in the same partition. Uh, so more about the topology, it's actually, it's actually, it is actually quite simple. We use uh, MQP resources to define the, um, uh, the super stream, but it's just metadata. Uh, the, again, uh, the, the stream client will not go through uh, an exchange um, or anything, but it will just use this information. So for uh, our invoices super stream, we are uh, going to define this uh, invoices uh, direct exchange and bind it with uh, some convention uh, routing keys to uh, its, its, uh, its individual streams. So we provide uh, a CLI command at super stream. Uh, it has a few parameters that you can uh, use. So in this case, it's just the name and the number of partitions. And then we, we just, the, the, the command will create this uh, AMQP topology. And then the topology information is available through the stream protocol. And this is what the, the client library will use. So just some details on the implementation. And the consuming part. So this is the tricky part actually. So we have SuperStream to scale out, so mainly to scale out uh, the consumption. If you have uh, several instances of your uh, application, uh, you want them uh, to have their own partition, okay, to scale out on different processes on different VMs. But if you have only one instance of your consuming application, you want it to get everything. So uh, you start up your first in instance uh, of your uh, application, and then it's gonna get uh, the messages from all 
partition. This is why we, on this figure, you have the small square, colored square. Okay, so one uh, green, blue, and purple. Uh, and automatically, the, the, the system will uh, send the messages from uh, all the partitions to this uh, instance. But then you have the second one coming. So it needs to get, um, uh, it needs to get some messages. Uh, so it will kind of steal the messages from invoices uh, dash one in this case. And then we're gonna get the last one uh, and we are all balanced because the last one will again get assigned one partition. Okay, this is pretty much what we want. Uh, this is how it works. You know, you don't start all your instances at once. Uh, it's usually one after the other. And then you get in some kind of stable state and uh, for this stable state, you want to scale out, okay? So this is, um, we, we, can, we, we have this with SuperStreams, but we can dive into uh, the details uh, to see what uh, the client library uh, must do, actually. So uh, this is what we have uh, currently in the Java, the Stream Java client library. So when you start your consumer, just specify it's a consumer for a super stream. And under the covers, it will start three consumers, one for each partition. And um, we are gonna have um, a, a, a group of single active consumers for each partition. Currently, uh, with only one instance for all this um, partition, we have only one member in the group. But um, when we uh, start the second one, uh, we uh, have over consumers coming in the group for each partition. So it's not exactly as with single active consumer, but that's basically the same uh, mechanism. If we were having just a single active consumer there, uh, we, you, we will just put the, the new consumer in line, okay? And only the first instant will still receive messages. The other one, uh, the other uh, consumers will just be idle and waiting. But this is not what we want, okay? So um, we still have the same single active consumer semantics, but we actually balance uh, um, the, the consumers a bit because the system knows that it's for a super stream. Okay, so now in this case, um, we, uh, for example, for the middle uh, partition, uh, the second consumer coming in the, in the party will uh, be activated, okay? And um, same thing for the last one, uh, the system will figure that the, um, for the last, um, for the last partition, the second the invoice is dash two, uh, the last consumer con coming to the party should get activated. So just imagine single active consumer or group for each partition. They are actually independent, these groups are independent, but the way the, the broker pick the active uh, consumer is just a bit different. It's not the next in line, it's using some modulo uh, operation actually. So with this composite pattern for each uh, SuperStream consumer uh, and a bit of logic, we managed to uh, get to a stable, uh, stable state at the end and stable and scaled out. Okay. So that's pretty much it, wrapping up. So a couple of major uh, asks asked uh, features in uh, RabbitMQ uh, 3.11 for uh, streams. So single active consumer um, to have your system, uh, you know, uh, keeping up when your instances go away, your consumer instances go away and building on this logic, this mechanism to have super streams to, uh, to scale out. Now we plan to enter some uh, uh, stabilization phase we released a bunch of new features in, uh, in just one year, just imagine uh, just a few uh, months ago, a year ago, we uh, didn't have streams in RabbitMQ. So now we have streams, we have uh, single active consumer, we have partitioning. Uh, so we do not consider streams to be feature complete, 
but uh, we don't plan to have new major features in the next few months. Um, we'll also, uh, so we'll wait for uh, uh, feedback from the community, from customers, uh, to improve the system, to make it more reliable, more uh, uh, stable, and maybe add some tweaks uh, here and there. And uh, we'll also try to make all the client libraries cl kind of uh, uh, even. Uh, so uh, we have the, pretty much the same features in all of them because uh, single active consumer and super streams require some work on the client uh, libraries, like smart clients. Uh, so, uh, at the end of the slides, you have some uh, resources uh, if you want to learn more, documentation, and also links to the, uh, the client libraries that we uh, have for streams. Uh, and I think we have time now for uh, questions. Right? Thank you very much, Arnaud. Um, do we have any questions in the end? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, it was really good uh, you going through uh, what it means. So uh, one question that came to mind on super streams, as you're calling it, uh, when you have more than one consumer starting up one after the another, if there's one VM that's fine consuming, if there's a second VM coming up, uh, is there a way that you already guarantee once and only once delivery? Uh, no, no, we don't provide exactly once. Um... But uh, you can get basically duplicates. But if you, in the in the um, uh, Sony uh, case, uh, basically when you have your new instances coming up uh, correctly, um, the um, the um, the consumer which is deactivated uh, can do some um, cleaning before, so storing the offset before being deactivated. And uh, if it stores the, the offset somewhere in, on, in RabbitMQ and or in a, a specific database, uh, then the, the one which is uh, being activated can restart from there. So, so, so you know, yeah, so that, that was a joined up question that, do you tell us what the publish offset was for each message? Um, the, no, it's for the consumer side. I don't get your question, sorry. No, so what I'm saying is, let's say you've got three, as you yep. showed in the diagram, uh, one, two, and three. On one, it's all, you know, let's say there's a message one to 10. If consumer one, which was running, picked up offset five uh, and saved in the database, for example, or you know, somewhere else, in Erlang it would be Mnesia. So when consumer two comes up, assume that the Mnesia cluster is up uh, on the consumer side. Uh, and if it gets, I don't know, four and five, again, it knows I've, I have picked up, so somebody else did pick up four and five process, then therefore I'll, I'll start from six, right? Because it, it should pick up what the other one uh, entered in the database, okay? So um, you, um, there's a default um, automatic offset tracking strategy in the Java client, for example, or over clients. Okay. And uh, it will actually, uh, 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 if it's the exact same instance as the, the, the previous one, uh, the previous active one, uh, it will, uh, it, if it's consistent, it will actually look up in the same database and pick what the over uh, actually stored. And then we start from there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I've got a bunch of questions, actually. <laughs> so uh, first is, what is the difference in performance between IMQP client for stream and uh, streaming client? And what are the difference in features? I suppose that stream clients were introduced in order to, to cover all st uh, stream functionality, and maybe IMQP client doesn't support all the features stream streaming client supports. And the last question, if I add new partition into SuperStream, how uh, consumers get rebalanced. Okay, so um, uh, so the first question was, what's the difference between uh, MQP and the stream protocol for the client? Yeah. So uh, the MQP, uh, it's really uh, f 
not because, but the nature of, this, of, the, proto of the protocol. C, M, Q, P, even uh, 091 or 1.0 as uh, communication, uh, generic communication frameworks, uh, protocol, sorry. And the stream protocol has been optimized uh, with, uh, for throughput, basically. So we do a lot of batching when we uh, actually send uh, we publish messages. It's not one message at a time. It can be a bunch of them. Um, so yeah, there's batching pretty much everywhere. Uh, and uh, when you consume uh, messages you, um, using the stream protocol, you, you get the actually, uh, we use send, uh, the send file uh, system call. So you get one part of your stream directly uh, going from the file system to the socket without copying anything, and it goes, it goes directly to the client. Whereas with MQP, you have all this routing, which is a feature, but which is costly. Okay, you cannot use send file, for example, because we just deliver messages one by one. Okay, so it cannot compete in terms of uh, speed, uh, but it's just because it's a more uh, advanced protocol. MQP is a more advanced protocol, so we just, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> You, you have to find a trade-off in what it depends on what you want to do. Uh, and the other question was, uh, really forget, forget. So, so performance differences and uh, uh, third one was about uh, adding new partition, how uh, consumers get rebalanced. And okay, um, oh, and I forgot, yeah, you maybe ask for the difference in performance between MQP and streams, so it, it really depends, but several orders of magnitude, like it can be. 10 or 20 times faster, depending on a lot of parameters. Uh, so yeah, you should not rebalance. <laughs> it really depends. We, um, we, you, right now, we don't uh, really support in a reliable way uh, new, adding new partitions. You may have to restart your uh, instances to get fresh, basically. We can, we, it really depends on the, uh, uh, actually on the, 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 the client libraries. We could get the metadata uh, you know, every minute, for example, and update their routing and consumption and so on. Uh, but uh, be careful of adding new partitions. If you have strong, uh, you expect strong guarantees, for example, with the example uh, I took, uh, where you want all uh, customer ID, uh, you want all your invoices from the same customer ID going to one partition. If you add a partition, you will break this guarantee. Uh, so you, it really depends on the use case. Right. Uh, Thank you. It's not a soft problem, I would say, adding partitions, changing the partitions. Thank you. Um, we have an online question. Um, Thomas, Thomas Gardner, are you, are you there? Uh, do you want to unmute? No? Okay, so um, perhaps we, from uh, Dimitri, Dimitri Novik, if you are there, can you please unmute and uh, share? Yeah. Okay, so I will ask his, uh, his question. Is uh, stream replicas, uh, replication synchronous? so that the messages in all replicas are consistent? Um, um, no, it's, 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 it's synchronous. So basically, it uh, just goes and uh, for, um, you, you can have differences. Uh, one replica can be a bit more advanced than the other. It can happen. Uh, so no, it's uh, not synchronous. Otherwise, it will be too slow. Okay. Ah, and one question. Maybe Carl wants to say something about replication. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to sort of. It's semi-synchronous, I guess we would have to say. So uh, it has, like quorum keys, it's got quorum semantics. So if you have a, a stream with um, two replicas, so three, three copies in total, it will um, acknowledge your write when it's been replicated to two of those. So. Um, that's how we provide guarantees in terms of if you lose a replica, you won't lose um, committed rights um, 
very readily. So it's not asynchronous in the sense that there is no interaction with the other with the replication. There is definitely re uh, interaction with the replication. That's sort of quorum. Thank you, uh, Bashia. Do we have time enough for other questions? If time, yeah. <laughs> one last, perhaps, one last. <laughs> Is there any question here? Oh, okay. Who are you? The winner. Thanks for the talk. Um, if you truly wanted like a single active composite com consumer, so like rather than it being load balanced across three different instances, all of the partitions are consumed uh, by one instance. Is, is that possible? Sorry, say it again. If, if you wanted the, rather than it being a single active consumer oh. on each partition, like a, the composite, all, all of the partitions are consumed by one instance, uh, is that possible? Yeah, it's, it's possible, yeah, but uh, you don't scale out. Okay. See what I mean? It's just only one process, but it's still possible, yeah. I, I guess, can you in, enforce that with the, how, how do you stop it balance, like being balanced out? Uh, how do we do right currently to balance? That's your question. As in, does it automatically balance, or, or do you have a way of, of saying that if if this instance is the active consumer for any partition, it must be the? No, the... no, it's uh, automatically balanced. Okay. If so, it's, that's your question, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't you can't constrain it so that if there's one, it's for all of the partitions. Not really. No, no. You you could set your your play with single active consumer on each partition, basically doing this. Uh, but as soon as you uh, talk uh, super stream, you say it's a super stream, it will balance this way. Okay, but there are, I think, still ways to tinker what you want to do with single active consumer for, uh, on uh, each uh, partition. Well, thank you very much, Arnaud. A round of applause <laughs> for thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.